Hello, my name is Philippe Girin, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. And I'm Rachel Zachary. I'm from the political science department at McNeese. Welcome to your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue, nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history, as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman, she was a slave, a runway, an abolitionist, a nurse, and a spy. She may even show up in your wallet one day. Her name was Harriet Tubman. Along the way, we will sample some classic songs by African-American artists. We'll start with a duet by Ike and Tina Turner, Proud Mary. I love that song. Me too. Just hang tight until the 2 minute and 19 seconds mark. That is when things get really interesting. You know, every now and then I think you might like to hear something from us. Nice and easy. But there's just one thing, you see, we never, ever do nothing nice and easy. We always do it nice and rough. And we're going to take the beginning of this song and do it easy. But then we're going to do the finish rough. Today we do proud Mary. the story now. Left a good job in the city. Working for the man every night and day. And I never lost one minute of sleep. And I was worried about the way the thing might have been. Big women keep on Welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks. We just listened to Proud Mary by Ike and Tina Turner. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Rachel Zachary. Today we're exploring the life of a 19th century feminist, Harriet Tubman. We begin our journey in the antebellum South. We're not talking here about the antebellum South of Gone with the Wind with mint juleps and beautiful hoop dresses. We're talking about the antebellum world as it was experienced by slaves like Harriet Tubman. Retracing her life can be hard. Women tend to leave few traces in the archival record, especially when they were enslaved. We don't even know for sure when she was born. In fact, she didn't know. Mention dates ranging from 1820 to 1825. That much is for sure. She came from Maryland. Both her parents were enslaved. They had nine children in all. Raising a family in the context of slavery must have created unique challenges. It did. Harriet Tubman's mother was employed in a big house and had little time for her children, who essentially raised themselves. 
Harriet Tubman took care of her younger siblings at first, and then she was hired out to a white household to care for their baby. She was just five at the time, but despite her young age, she was put to work and whipped whenever the baby cried. One day, according to Tubman, she was whipped five times before breakfast. She was later assigned various odd jobs on nearby plantations like hauling logs. It took a big toll on her health. Beatings, constant toil, and separation from her family. This was a traumatic childhood, to say the least. At least she got to stay close to her family. Three of her sisters were simply sold off to other owners and disappeared forever. That kind of separation was tragically common in the 19th century. Slavery was expanding westward, but the Atlantic slave trade was no longer legal, so planters in Mississippi, or right here in Louisiana, simply bought surplus slaves from the East Coast. In the process, many families were torn apart. After losing three daughters that way, Harriet Tubman's mother learned that the youngest son, Moses, would be sold too. So Harriet's mother hid Moses for a month and then threatened to kill anyone who dared sell her son. The owner finally backed off. Young Harriet learned a valuable lesson from her mother that day. Slaves had few legal rights, but with enough courage and determination, it was possible to regain some agency and resist one's fate. On a completely different track, a slave could also gain his freedom if he agreed to collaborate with the system. That's what Harriet Tubman's father did. He was freed at the age of 45 when his master freed him in his will. But things did not always work out this way. The heirs were also supposed to free Harriet Tubman's mother, along with her children, but they chose to keep all of them enslaved instead. And so Harriet Tubman, her mother, and her siblings continued to toil for their master even though they could have been freed. Harriet Tubman eventually got married to a free black man, but because slavery went down the female line, she was destined to live the same life that her mother had, to bear enslaved children for her master and risk seeing them sold off. Violence remained part of Harriet Tubman's everyday life. At one point, she even refused to help track down a runaway slave. The overseer threw a heavy weight at her head, nearly cracking open her skull. Harriet Tubman spent two days covered in blood without receiving medical care, and then she was sent back to work in the fields. The incident left her with lifelong physical ailments, including headaches, epileptic seizures, and even visions from God. There was a spiritual side to her. She was convinced that God was leading her actions in some way. Maybe he did. At some point, Harriet Tubman's owner was planning to sell her off, and she began to pray for his death. Lo and behold, a week later, the owner died. Wow, maybe there is some divine justice after all. Harriet Tubman had an interesting take on Christianity. She rejected the New Testament stories about forgiveness and obedience. Instead, she found comfort in the Old Testament stories about resistance, like how Moses freed the Jews from slavery. I noticed that her little brother was called Moses. Later on, we'll see that the spiritual go-down Moses played an important role in her life. Let's listen to it now, shall we? Let's. Of the many recordings of this classic spiritual, I pick one by the blues singers Big Mama Sorton. Don't know much about her. What was her most famous songs? Well, there's Hound Dog. I thought that was by Elvis Presley. Big Mama Sorton recorded it first. She also recorded Ball and Chain years before Janis Joplin made it famous. Wow, there are always someone to upstage her, huh? Indeed. The most famous rendition of Go Down Moses is by Louise Armstrong, but we will go with Big Mama Sorkin's version to give her top billing for once. Go down, Moses, wait up.
just go down Moses Go down in Egypt land Tell on Tell on Pharaoh To let my people The good Lord spoke. Welcome back. We just listened to Go Down Moses, interpreted by Big Mama Thornton. I'm Rachel Zachary, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks, your favorite woman's history show on KBYS. Et je suis Philippe Girard, vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, the life and accomplishments of Harriet Tubman. Our story so far has been a pretty depressing one. There was no place for slaves like Harriet Tubman in antebellum U.S. society. There were mules and dogs, fit enough to work, but not welcome as citizens of the Republic. In 1849, after the death of Harriet Tubman's owner, his widow made plans to sell the whole family. Three sisters had already been lost that way. This would have been completed the destruction of the family. But Harriet Tubman was not the kind of person to lie down and await her fate. Quote, there was one of two things I had the right to do. She explained later, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. I like her embrace of the motto, liberty or death, which goes back to the American Revolution. Even though she was denied her humanity under U.S. law, she insisted on claiming America's revolutionary ideals as her own. That's our theme for today. How Harriet Tubman tried to refashion the grand American experiment with liberty so that it would include blacks as well as whites. So in 1849, against her husband's advice, Harriet Tubman decided to escape. She took two of her brothers along and ran away. Soon after their departure, the brothers got cold feet, which forced Harriet Tubman to call off the escape. But she was no quitter. Soon after, she escaped again. This time, she was on her own. No one could stop her. Amazingly, she managed to make it through Maryland and Delaware all the way to Pennsylvania. This was a journey of 90 miles on foot through hostile territory. Here is what she said after she made it to Pennsylvania. Quote, when I found I had crossed the line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was so much glory over everything. The sun seemed like gold through the trees. And over the fields, I felt like I was in heaven. I think it's time for a triumphant song about freedom. Think by Aretha Franklin? That's the one. Welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. Je suis Philippe Girard. 
And I'm Rachel Zachary. Today we're covering the life of Harriet Tubman, a Maryland slave who escaped to freedom in 1849. Harriet Tubman was not the only slave to flee that year. The U.S. was split in two between free and slave states, so it was possible for people who lived not too far from the border to find freedom in the North. That's how Frederick Douglass, another slave from Maryland, earned his freedom. We also had a show about Anna Crafts, a slave from North Carolina, who found freedom in the North. What's unusual about Tubman is she didn't simply lie low. No, she said, quote, My father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were in Maryland still, but I was free and they should be free. Clearly, she was still traumatized by the way her family members had been stolen over the years. She was not going to let slavery destroy what remained of her family. So in 1850, when she heard that her niece and two young children were about to be sold away, she arranged for their escape. Then in 1851, she traveled back to Maryland to save her young brother Moses. That took some incredible courage. She had just gained her freedom, and yet she walked right back to the lion's den to save her loved ones. That was not the only time. Soon she was back in Maryland yet again to help her husband escape. But when she reached her old plantation, she discovered that her husband had already remarried and that he had no intention of leaving his new wife. Ouch! But she was a practical woman, so she left her no good husband behind and helped some other slaves escape instead. Good for her! In all that, she made 13 trips to the South and helped free at least 70 slaves. She knew all the tricks. She would travel in the winter because nights were longer, and she would leave on Saturdays because papers didn't publish runway ads on Sunday, which gave her two-day head start. Quote, I was conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, she said, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. The Underground Railroad was so successful that Southern slaveholders lobbied Congress to pass the Fugitive Slave Act. We're exploring some pretty dark corners of U.S. history today, and that act ranks as one of the most shameful ever passed by the U.S. Congress. It forced authorities in free states to collaborate with slave catchers trying to recover runaways. That meant that even in Pennsylvania, Harriet Tubman was always at risk of being recaptured. But she did not back down. Instead, she extended the Underground Railroad all the way to Canada so that she and other runaways could live beyond the reach of U.S. law. On her way, she stayed at the home of the other great black abolitionist of her time, Frederick Douglass. Douglas is very impressed by Tubman's courage. Here is what he once wrote her, quote, Most of what I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought in the day, you in the night. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been witnesses of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. The great white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison was also impressed by Harriet Tubman. He nicknamed her Moses. Earlier we listened to Go Down Moses, which she would sing during her trip south. She used it as a kind of code to indicate to runaways the path was clear. That seems like a good time for another song. Are we going to listen to Go Down Moses again? No, I decided to go with Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn. Well, that's a controversial one. It was banned in some southern states for a while. You're right. The lyrics are very political. But it's a beautiful song and it fits today's topic to a T. Town dogs on my trail School children sitting in jail Black hat cross my path I think every day is gonna be my last Lord have mercy on this land of mine We all gonna get it in due time I don't belong here, I don't belong there I've even stopped believing in prayer Years. You told me to wash and clean my ears. 
dance and talk real fine Just like a lady You'd stop calling me Sister Sadie Nobody anymore We keep on saying Go slow Yeah, that's what they say Go slow Well, that's just the trouble Desegregation Mass participation Unification Mississippi Goddamn by Nina Simone. You're listening to your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I'm Rachel Zachary. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Today we are retracing the life of the abolitionist Harriet Tubman, who ran away for freedom in 1849 and then helped dozens of other slaves escape to freedom just like she did. By the 1850s, slavery divided the U.S. in half. At stake was the future of the country, and which place people of African descent would occupy in it. It's in this context that a slave named Dred Scott petitioned the courts for his freedom on the ground that his owners had taken him to northern states where slavery was not legal. The matter went all the way to the Supreme Court, which decided that Dred Scott had no right to sue in the first place. Why? Because people of African descent, whether free or not, were not really American citizens, even when they were born on U.S. soil. That's truly shameful. That's generally considered the worst U.S. Supreme Court decision of all times. By this point, abolitionists were divided on which course of action to pursue. Some, like Frederick Douglass, had hoped a nonviolent techniques like legal action would eventually prevail. Others, like Harriet Tubman, thought that the time had come to take a more proactive stance. So in 1859, she moved back from Canada to Auburn, New York. That was a courageous decision because she and her family were now at risk of being taken by slave captures under the Fugitive Slave Act. But she was done waiting to be accepted as a U.S. citizen. In 1859, she helped the radical abolitionist John Brown plan a slave revolt in Virginia. Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry was a failure, but it marked the beginning of armed resistance against slavery, what eventually became the Civil War. When the actual war broke out in 1861, Tubman actively supported the North. That was groundbreaking in many ways. A battlefield was not considered a place for a woman, white or black. The black soldiers were not welcome in the Union Army early in the conflict. In fact, Lincoln refused to make the war about slavery to avoid losing white supporters in the North. But Tubman was confident that in the end, Lincoln would see the light. Quote, God won't let Master Lincoln beat the South till he does the right thing, she said. Which is exactly what happened. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War became a crusade for black freedom. Early on, Tubman was active around Port Royal, South Carolina, where she helped slaves escape their master. Then she moved to Florida, where she provided key intelligence that helped Union forces capture Jacksonville. Her greatest accomplishment came in 1863. That year, she led a raid along the Combahee River in South Carolina. She helped free 750 slaves, more than ever in her life. She also served as a nurse. By the time the Civil War ended in 1865, she was a genuine war hero. Except that it would take her another 30 years to be accepted as such. Wow, what a long path to do acceptance. Indeed, but we'll get there in the end. First, let's take another musical break with Diana Ross. You can depend and never worry
And I'm Rachel Zachary. This was Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Deanna Ross. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS, a show about remarkable women in centuries past. Today's woman was particularly remarkable. We retrace the life of Harriet Tubman all the way from slavery in Maryland to victory in the Civil War. You would think that her lifelong struggle for acceptance was finally over, and you would be wrong. In 1868, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution did say that every person born in the U.S. was a citizen no matter what the color of their skin might be, thus reversing the Dred Scott decision. That officially made Harriet Tubman a U.S. citizen at long last. But in the years that followed, more subtle forms of racial segregation appeared under the rule of Jim Crow. These would remain the norm for another 100 years. Once, when taking the train in New York, Harriet Tubman was forced to be moved to the smoking car because white passengers objected to her presence. She stood her ground, but her arm was broken in a scuffle, and she was forced out of the passenger compartment. Kind of like an early Rosa Parks. Exactly. Also, don't forget that as a black woman, she suffered from two forms of prejudice, racial and sexual. She joined the suffragette movement and campaigned for female suffrage, but passage of the 19th Amendment was still many decades away. You would think that as a Civil War hero, she had done enough for her country to gain the right to vote. Apparently not. In fact, the government would not even recognize her as a veteran. Incredibly, that was true. She was unable to collect a pension despite her wartime heroism, so she went back to work on the family farm in Auburn, New York. She also took boarders to make ends meet. One of these boarders was a dashing young Civil War veteran named Nelson Davis. He was 22 years younger than she was, but they fell in love and they got married in 1869. He died in 1888, so amazingly, Harriet Tubman outlived her much younger husband by 25 years. She was a survivor. In the meantime, she had finally managed to convince Congress to award her a pension of $20 a month for her service during the Civil War. She was still suffering from the beating she had received as a slave. In fact, her head hurt so much that she went through open brain surgery to relieve the pressure. In lieu of anesthetics, she simply bit on a bullet. That's what she had seen soldiers do during the Civil War. That was one tough woman. Despite experiencing slavery, beatings, a Civil War, and an experimental brain surgery, she lived into her 90s. Pneumonia? is what finally did her end in 1913. The Jim Crow laws were still in effect, so she didn't live long enough to witness the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which finally abolished all forms of public discrimination based on race or gender. But this time, she was finally accepted as a true American hero. Since her death, there have been statues in her honor, a postage stamp, and even a U.S. Navy ship named after her. President Barack Obama dedicated a national monument to the Underground Railroad and even proposed to put her on the $20 bill. That would be a nice change. Right now we only have white men on bills, several of them slave owners, which symbolically excludes women and minorities from the nation. I'm looking forward to the change. If it takes place, Obama's successor is a big fan of Andrew Jackson and of a more traditional vision of American society, so he's talking of keeping Jackson on a 20 and instead putting Harriet Tubman on the $2 bill. $2 bill? That's like asking her to move to the back of the bus all over again. Yes, hopefully people will come to their senses and finally give her the recognition that she deserves. She'll get there in the end. She's a fighter. Nothing will stop her. Well, what a life. We're glad we got to share it with you. This program is funded by the Juliet Hartner Grant for Women in the Humanities. For more information on how to help finance fellowships at McNeese, contact the Foundation at 337-475-5588. Thank you and goodbye. Merci, au revoir.